<laughs> Thank you, bro. <laughs> Thank you. Well, yeah, it, it is a blessing, a privilege to be with you this morning. And as bro say, I am, I am I'm blessed to be married to one of the best physical therapists here in town. I actually, when, I, when we started going to our church now, which is the Awakening Church here in Murrieta, <clears throat> we walk in into the church right in the middle of COVID, and my wife seems to know all the older gentlemen in the in the church, right. and everybody's greeting her, and I say, "What's going on?" And it's just she's being their therapist, so everybody knows her, and everybody's like, "I say, well, you're more famous than I am, right. which is great, <laughs> you know." And all the guys have to say, "Yeah, she's been a blessing. She has this gift of evangelism, and also." Whatever she goes to, she's always praying for the patients, and, you know, it's just really a blessing. I will say that that is one of the reasons why I am who I am today. It's because the Lord has used her tremendously in my life. And it's really, it's really a blessing to have a wife that cares for you, that loves the Lord, and that prays for you and the family all the time. Well, uh, as uh, bro say, my name is Oliver Cardenas, and uh, I've been a pastor for 20 years now. I've been a church planter. I actually was born and raised in Mexico City, came to California 17 years ago, I uh, know, 27 years ago when I was 17 years old. And um, I remember the first town that I stopped in was Temecula 27 years ago. And it was very different then. There was no houses here. It was just like fields and it was uh, a valley, very nice. Remember, get, remember getting out of the, the bus that I came in and I look into the valley. I say, the Lord, I, I told the Lord, I say, God, my American dream, because I'm an immigrant, they say, is to live in Temecula one day. And I little did I know that the Lord was going to bring me into this part of town 10 years ago, fulfilling his promises. Uh, end up uh, in San Gabriel Valley in, in Monrovia. I don't know if you're familiar with that area. I went to high school there, and then uh, the Lord called me to start serving him with youth ministries in the city of Baldwin Park. Uh, my first calling was to serve with uh, young people that were involved in drugs and gangs and teen pregnancies and all that stuff. That was really, it was really challenging and fun at the same time. <clears throat> and then after that, the Lord called me to start planting churches, Spanish-speaking churches in L.A. County. Uh, as I say, 10 years ago... We moved to Temecula, uh, to be honest, because I was in church planting for over 10 years. I was already very tired, very worn out. Church planting is very challenging for those of you that know a little bit of that. It's like you're working, you're working in a circus. You do everything in church planting, from greeting people to like do the worship, and you preach, and then you pray for people, and then you go take them home, and you got to clean the church and all that different stuff. And anyways... So we came here 10 years ago, and um, when we came here, we came here with a lot of uncertainty because we have no house, no friends, no ministry, and my wife and I were just kind of like saying, we just have to find a different place to start all over. So we came here, and, uh, and then we found ourselves being blessed by the Lord. The Lord started like bringing us to new friends. He led us to new ministry and all that. And I can say that I was in the top of the world. I don't know. Have you ever had one of those experiences where you feel like everything is going great in your life? Like you are like, man, this is the crossroads of everything. Like everything I done in life, everything I wanted to do happened right here. And we started seeing God's miracles. We started seeing how God started providing and multiplying everything. And all of a sudden, the Lord uh, allowed me to start serving with this international Christian ministry. It's called Every Generation Ministries. And what they do is that they equip uh, Sunday school teachers all over the world with uh, training and Bible teaching resources to impact the lives of children. And the Lord opened the door for me to start serving with this organization as the Latin American director. Wow, what a big title, right? And I was going into, all of a sudden, the Lord was bringing me all over the place. I have the opportunity to travel to 27 countries in the last seven years. I spoke in front of three people and I spoke in front of 20,000 people. I mean, places that I never thought the Lord was going to take me. I was really on top of the world. And I was seeing God's provision and multiplication and all that. And you know what? That brought me to something I want to share with you this morning. Because I, as I was reflecting on what to share with you, 
I was thinking about our Lord Jesus, of course. And I was thinking about his ministry. And uh, we are in this Holy Week, right? We are getting ready to celebrate Easter Sunday. And I was thinking maybe I can talk about the Last Supper, John chapter 14. Maybe I can talk about his crucifixion. Maybe I can talk about his resurrection. But I wanted to talk a little bit about, a, a little bit about all that, but I want to go back a little bit into the beginning of his ministry. When he started walking on this earth, when he started like talking about the kingdom of God, when he was healing and delivering people from demon possession, when he was being persecuted by the religious leaders of that day. I wanted to start talking about that. And I wanted to start talking about one of the miracles that he did that was very evident for people when he started multiplying the bread and the fish. So if you allow me, let me pray before we go into the word of God. Father God, I thank you, Lord, for this day and the blessing that I have to share with my brothers in this room. Lord, I pray that you will speak to us through your word. And I thank you, Lord, for all the blessings that you give to us, for the way, Lord, that you provide, and Lord, most especially for who you are in us. Lord Jesus, we ask that you guide us, Lord. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will also reveal to us your word today. And I thank you, Father, for this opportunity. Lord, we pray all this in your mighty name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So I'm sure you're familiar with that story when Jesus multiplied the bread and the fish and how, the test, how he tested the faith of the disciples. It was really a, a wonderful miracle to see how with so little he can do so much. And I know you know that, you, all of you know that story, but I would just want to take from Mark chapter, um, let's read from Mark chapter... 6, starting verse 42. This is kind of like the end of that miracle when all the people were uh, fed. It says here that there were about 5,000 men, not counting women and children. So we can talk about maybe 15,000, 20,000, 25,000, 30,000 people. But it says here in the Word of God, it says in uh, Mark 6, verse 42 and 43, it says, They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples pick up the twelve basketfuls of broken pieces of bread, of bread and fish. And the number of men who had eaten was 5,000. So I, have, I, I want to ask you this question again. Can you remember a moment when you felt that everything was going great in your life? The moment when you saw God providing for your life in an amazing way. Where you saw things that they were impossible to happen, but he multiplied everything in your life. I'm not just talking about money. I'm not just talking about the material provision, but other things that were provided for you. You know, I can say that when I had that experience, I had that experience about seven years ago when uh, the Lord called me to serve with this international ministry. I was really on the top of the world. I saw how the Lord provided and opened doors for me. And I can say I was kind of like what the Word of God says here. I was satisfied. I was in a moment in my life where I can say, Wow, this is great. You know, I, I can die today and I can say I don't at all. You know, I travel, I preach, I met people, I ate, I'm satisfied. I have a nice house. I have a nice family. I have everything I need in life. And you know what? This is what happened to the disciples right there. And then they saw Jesus performing this amazing miracle. And I'm sure they all felt like, man, this guy is great. He heals, plus he gives us free breakfast, plus he, you know, teaches us, plus, you know, wherever we go, it's like we see him doing great things. They were at the top of the world. And, you know, it's interesting what happens next, because in verse 45, look at what it says here. It says immediately, so right after that, right when they feel they were in the top of the world, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat. So it's interesting because they're having this, this high, right? They feel like, wow, this is amazing. But then right after that, Jesus said, guys, get on the boat. And that is very interesting because what happens after, right after that is it's, uh, it's, it's an interesting story because it says, and go, and it says here, the, his, disciple, his disciples get, in, get into the boat and go on ahead of him to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd, 
in verse 46 says, After leaving them, he went up, he went up on a mountainside to pray. So the disciples were sent out by Jesus on the boat to another town. But he said, oh, by the way, guys, I'm not going with you. You guys, you guys got to get on that boat while I'm going to do another thing. I'm going to pray. And I'm looking at that and I say, you know what? Jesus was about to test them and to remind them about and to show them who he really was. And who was really on top of the world. Because they felt like they were on top of the world at that moment. But Jesus was about to say, I'm going up in the mountainside to pray. I'm going to be taking care of my father's businesses. And while you guys go into this boat, into this town. And, you know, what happened there is the disciples have lost sight of him. But one thing that we see here is that Jesus did not lose sight of them. And his concern for them overcame the lack of faith. Because what happens right after that, as they are on the boat, verse 48 says, And he saw the disciples straining at the oars, because the wind was against them. Another version say, they were very tired, trying to go against the wind. And think about this. Some of these disciples were very expert fishermen. They knew what to do in the middle of a lake or in the middle of the water. They knew how to handle this. However, they were going against the wind. And you know, I want to stop there because I was telling you about my experience being on top of the world seven years ago. All of a sudden, I had this opportunity to be a missionary, to get out of the Temecula Valley and go around the world and tell everybody about the Lord Jesus Christ. I met pastors all over the world. I had the opportunity to preach in one of the very first Christian churches in the Philippines, in the south part of the Philippines. I had the opportunity to speak at the, one of the largest churches in Mexico in front of 10,000 people. I have all these experiences where I met people that were serving the Lord in so many different capacities. I was at the top of the world. And I feel like, hey, I know how to get on the boat and get in the middle of the lake and, and handle these situations. But you know what? Something happened. Three years ago, 2019, I uh, was in a mission trip in Mexico City. I fell, I broke my leg, and I couldn't walk for 120 days. And that was the first time I saw myself in a situation when I needed to depend on someone else. I remember being at the airport in Mexico City and having to ask somebody to push me to the restroom so I can use the restroom for the first time in my life. My life was full of fear. All of a sudden I started thinking, what will I do now? I cannot walk. I'm supposed to walk. I'm supposed to go around the world. I'm supposed to tell people about the Lord. I'm supposed to encourage Sunday school teachers that are serving children all over the world in Latin America, in Argentina, in Peru, in Mexico in Chile, in Colombia, wherever the Lord was taking me, but now I cannot walk. Now I cannot do what I love to do, what keeps me on the top of the world. And then, right after that, when I was just starting getting better, so I, break my, I broke my leg on May 2019, I started walking on September 2019, and then once I started like, taking my steps again and get, getting ready to go, then COVID hit. And you know what, I, can, I know all of you relate to this because COVID stopped everything for all of us. And we find ourselves in the middle of the lake trying to go against the wind. And many of us went through moments where we feel like, where is Jesus in all this? I don't know if you can relate to that, but to me, that was my case. It was like, Jesus, I'm supposed to be going out there and telling people about you. Where, where, where are you? You left us. I was full of fear. And you know what? I know that there are situations in life that we feel like that. It doesn't necessarily have to be COVID, but it can be anything else. It can be a diagnostic. Your health is failing you. You feel your, your finances are in the wrong place. You know, your family, your marriage, your children. There's so many situations where we can feel like we're right in the middle of the lake. 
Where is that moment when we were feeling top of, and on top of the world? Where did you go, Jesus, when I saw you multiplying everything? When I saw you that you were doing this amazing miracle in my life and all of a sudden I am right here in the middle of nowhere. It is interesting because verse 48 says, Shortly before dawn he went out on them walking on the lake. And it is interesting because another version of the Bible talks about a specific time of the day. It was actually very dark. They've been dealing with this situation for hours. They've been going against the wind for a long time. And you know what? When you go against the wind for a long time, when you go against the situations for a long time, when you're trying on your own to face your own situations, you're going to get tired very easily. You're going to get worn out, exhausted. You're going to feel like, you know, I cannot go on anymore. And when you feel that way, it's so easy to throw the towel. It's so easy just to think about, like, I'm just going to go back where I was. Kind of like what happened to the people of Israel when the Lord promised them that he, they were going to be taken into a promised land. Where things were going to get better for them. They got tired of going in circles and eating the same food every day. And they started complaining about it. And many of them say, I think we were better when we were slaves back in Egypt. And you know what? That is one of the lies of the enemy that he uses against us. When situations are going against us, when we feel that Jesus left the boat, we feel like there's no hope. And it's easier just to give up. It is easier just to go back to the things that will destroy us. It is easy to find comfort and relief on things that are temporary. It is easy just to pick up a beer or go look at that site or do something that you don't supposed to be doing. Just trying to feel better for the moment. It is easy to be angry. Easier to feel like no one understands you. And that is all the result of fear. Because that's what fear does. Fear does that to us. It's that emotion that makes us be on the defensive. It's a, it helps us to like try to find a way of surviving the situation. And, uh, and, the, and the disciples were going through that. They were full of fear. They went from being on top of the world, seeing all these things, and all of a sudden they were in the middle of a situation that they thought they can control because they knew what to do on a boat, but they found themselves without control of the situation. And I feel that many times we feel that we need to control everything around us, isn't it? Especially as men. Oh, I want to have control of everything. I want to control my schedule. I want to control my wife. I want to control my children. I want to control my finances. I want to control my health. I want to control everything. Because I'm a man. That's what I'm supposed to do. And Jesus was saying, watch. Watch me. <laughs> watch on what I'm about to do. Because what happens later on, it says here in verse 49, but they saw him walking on the lake. And the first reaction says, they thought, he was a ghost. Oh my gosh. I, I will be freaked out. Honestly. It's dark. You're so tired. You're probably hungry already. Even though you ate a lot. The day, a couple hours before. But you're already hungry. You are all like cold and wet. And you're going with all this stuff. And then all of a sudden you see this image. Walking on a lake. It will be super scary. The fear that they felt was crazy. He says here, they cry out because they all saw him. And the next word it says here, they were terrified. They were afraid. They were full of fear. And I was thinking and look, I was asking the Lord, I said, Lord, where is the first time that we see the word fear in us? In your scripture. And then I went back to Genesis. And you know there's a reference on Genesis chapter 3. Right where um, Satan tempts Eve and Adam. In the, in, the, in the garden. And it says there that right after they fell into disobedience. The Lord started calling their names. And they realized they realized that they were naked. And when the Lord started calling their names, they went to hide. 
And it says there, because they were afraid. Fear led them to that. And you know what? That's what sin does. Sin makes us afraid of God in the sense of not to be afraid of Him in the sense of like He's going to, we feel that He's going to punish us, that he's going, He doesn't going to accept us, that He doesn't care for us. It's one of the tactics that the enemy uses to make us feel inadequate, to make us feel that we are not worthy, to make us feel that He will not care for us, to make us run away from His grace and His mercy. And I can think about the disciples as they were in the boat. They feel terrified. They feel afraid, full of fear. And their faith was tested one, one, once again. And it, and it says here, the words of the Lord, it's, it's amazing because when Jesus saw them that they were terrified, immediately, again it says, he spoke to them and said, Take courage. It is I. Do not be afraid. <laughs> Isn't that comforting? As he was telling them, you guys felt like giving up. You were in the worst situation that you thought that you were going to be. But say, don't be afraid. Take courage. And then he uses this word, it is I. This is a reference about the I am. The I, it is I, God. It is me who is here with you. Take courage. Do not be afraid. And you know, the Word of God has about 365 references of n not to be af afraid or not fear. It's like God wants to remind us every day, every single day. Do not be afraid. Take courage. It is I. I am Jesus. I am God. The Son of God. I am here. And it's true because every day we are going to face our fears. Every day we are going to be challenged. Every day we may be feeling that we're going on the boat again and again and again and again and again and again. And that we're going against the wind. Whatever the circumstances. But the Lord is telling us today and reminding us that we should not be afraid to take courage because He is God. He is in control. He is in control of your life. He's in control of your family. He's in control of your health. He's in control of your ministry. He's in control of everything. Uh, actually, all that that you, think, that, think, that you think is yours is not even yours. It's His. He's just asking you to take care of that. He's asking you to be a good steward of the things that He has blessed you with. So don't ever think that you have all these things under control. Don't ever think that this is all what you've done. That was a good reminder when I was going through, when I broke my leg, I was just thinking in that moment, I went from being on top of the world down into the cave, <laughs> and I was just thinking, Lord, I, it's foolish. Sometimes you think you're doing all these great things. Some things you think, oh my gosh, my name is in Facebook all over the place, or I'm being speaking in front of thousands of people. That's all. You know, it's important, yes, to share your gospel and all that, but if it's not for you, if it's not for your glory, it's not for your honor, if it's not something that you really want me to do, then what's the point? You know, I don't need to have control on all these things. I need to let you control all that. Verse 51 says, they, he, he climbed into the boat with them. <laughs> and look at what happened after he did that. Because he said, he went into the boat with them. And we will think like, oh, well, that, that's over, right? He probably said, oh, you guys, again? Oh, you little faith, come on. No, but do what, what happens here, it says, verse 50, 52 says, it says here in verse 51, it says, and the wind died down. When Jesus got into the boat, the wind died down. Everything was calm. Everything was in peace. And that is that fulfillment of that promise. That He will give us that peace that surpasses all understanding. 
that he is the Prince of Peace, that he is the one that can bring that peace in the middle of all the chaos, in the middle of all the situations that we are going through, in the middle of all the, 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 the circumstances that are against us. It's just a reminder about that he will bring peace to us. And what it says here is that they were completely amazed. See that? They, were, they went from being terrified... They went from being tired and exhausted and disappointed to being terrified, to being full of fear, into being amazed by what the Lord did in their lives. And it's just, I think as we read this, we can all relate to that and just be reminded about like this morning and this day. It's like, just wait to be amazed for what the Lord will do in your life. Wait for the Lord to get on your boat. Wait for him to just like take care of stuff. It's going to be amazing. And verse 52 says, For they had not understood about the loaves because their hearts were hardened. And it circles back to that miracle. It circles back to the event where they felt that everything was on top of the world. And it's just like, I, I got to say these three things. Maybe the reasons why they didn't want to believe is be, perhaps because, number one, they couldn't accept that this human named Jesus was really the Son of God. At that moment, they're still doubting about it. They feel like, we cannot understand who he is. Maybe they dared not to believe that the Messiah would choose them as his followers. It was too good to be true, right? It is too good to be true to be called this a child of God. It is too good to be true to be forgiven for our sins by grace, by His sacrifice on the cross. It is too good to be true to be called by my name and not for what I've done. It is too good to be true to receive this unmerited favor of God. Who are we? They were thinking maybe we're just fishermen. We're just people that nobody cares. Ordinary people. We're not religious leaders. We don't have we're not eloquent. We don't have this education that requires for us to have this title. It is too good to be true, to be walking next to the Son of God. Or maybe they still do not understand the real purpose for Jesus coming into the earth. Their disbelief took the form of the misunderstanding. And that happens today. A lot of people don't understand what Jesus came to the world for. And I hope that all of us understand what he came to the world for. You know, it's, uh, it's for the forgiveness of our sins, for the, or rest, the restoration of our life, for the promise of eternal life in His name, for us to be not running away from Him because of fear, but coming to Him because we know that He loves us, that we know that He cares for us, that we know that He gave everything for us. Just like the Bible says that, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. That gift of salvation through His name, it's beautiful. So, do not let fear overtake you. You know, just to think about today, if we look into the calendar and look into the tradition, today will be the celebration of the Last Supper. In that time where... Jesus was saying to his disciples, the time has come when I have to be going into that cross, that I will die. So you and everybody that believes in me, the world can be forgiven. I'll be the one that will be given as the perfect lamb, as the ultimate offering for the forgiveness of the sins. And they were all afraid because in their minds they were still thinking, this Messiah will liberate us from the Roman Empire. This Messiah will give us the freedom that we need right now so we can control our situation right now so we can be on top of the world right now. But Jesus was saying, it's not what you're expecting. My kingdom is different. What I will do is totally, it's going to blow up your minds. You have no idea what is to come. And it says in, in John chapter 14, verses 1 to 3, in that last conversation, during that last supper, he already washed his disciples' feet. He was already telling them that he was leaving. And he was warning them that we're not going to be alone. That there, there was going to be the Holy Spirit with them. 
You know, and it says here in verse 14, in, I'm sorry, uh, John chapter 14, verses 1 to 3, it says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house, have, my father's house have, has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. He was telling them, do not be afraid about the current situation. What is to come is way better. The blessings that are on the way, the salvation that is on the way, what you will do in my name. Yes, you will be persecuted. Yes, you will die because of my name. Yes, you will go through so many troubles and tribulations. They will kill you because of my name. But do not be afraid of that. Don't let your hearts be troubled. And I think that's, that's something that we must be rem- remember. We need to remember that, especially during this time of reflection, of celebration, of knowing that Christ is alive, knowing that he, that he trumped over dead, knowing that he came out of that tomb and that he is, is in heaven. He's at the, seated at the, at the throne. We need to remember that. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God and believe also in Him. And the last time Jesus told His disciples not to be afraid, we find that in Matthew chapter 28, verse 8. Right when He resurrected, so the women hurried away from the tomb. They were afraid, yet filled with joy. And He ran to tell His disciples, they, they ran to, and ran to tell the disciples, and suddenly Jesus met them and said, Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet and worshipped him. And then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Amen. See that? You see the events that happen here? One after another, one after another, Jesus was telling them, don't be afraid. I am with you. I never left you. And then when he goes on and tells them about this great commission that we know in Matthew chapter 28, this last instruction that he gave to the disciples, he tells them there, I will be with you always. I will not leave you or forsake you. I will be there always. So to close today, I want to say this. Do you know that, that it is true in our lives today? That Jesus will be with us always. So I don't know what happened, or I don't know what you're going through. I don't know if you just, you're still on top of your, on top of the world, on top of the hill right now in your life. But I tell you, you're about to like go down again. And that's the way it works. Right when we think everything is going great, we are going to face another challenge. There's going to be another situation. There's going to be another moment where we need to come back and be reminded about the Lord's promises. I want to encourage us. I want to encourage you to not be afraid. I want to encourage you to wait for the Lord to get on your boat. I want to encourage you to worship Him, to seek Him, to ask Him, to not run away from Him, but come back to Him, to tell Him, Lord, please, I need you. Help me. Whatever you're going through right now, I just want to encourage you with that. As we celebrate this Easter weekend, as we celebrate this time that, that means so much for us as believers, let's be reminded about that. Let's be reminded that the Lord never left us, that He is with us always, and that He is coming back soon. Amen. Most especially that. Because times are difficult, situations are hard, but do not feel that your situation is, God cannot take care of that because there's nothing impossible for Him. There's nothing that God cannot do. So with that, I just want to, to encourage you and to pray for you and to thank you for the opportunity that I can share these words with you this morning. And I will also ask you to pray for me as um, the Lord has allowed me to continue to do my ministry through Latin America. Next week, I'm going to be traveling down to Oaxaca, Mexico, which is in the south part of the country to visit the pastors and Sunday school teachers there. 
Next month, I will have the blessing to travel back to Argentina after two years and a half since COVID started. Last month, I was in Peru, uh, uh, in Lima, Peru, uh, serving uh, churches there and all that. And I also want to ask you to pray for the churches in Latin America. Because, you know, we were having conversations this morning about COVID and how COVID stopped our plans and things that happened to us during COVID. But I tell you, COVID hit differently in different places, on the, in different countries in the world. Here in this country, we're so blessed with everything we have. I mean, Walmart never closed, right? Home Depot was always open. We have access to things. Hospitals were functional. Uh, you know, we were able to meet online and do all these different things and, and have, you know, food in our houses and electricity and all these things that we needed. In other places, that wasn't the case. Other places, there were people that were indoors in a small apartment for months, for nine months, and they couldn't get out. Uh, churches where pastors die because of COVID. Uh, churches that never were able to reopen again because people lost their income. They have to leave their towns to go into another city so they can provide for their families. Um, all kinds of situations that have been very difficult. So I will ask you to please also pray for that. Pray for the mission work that the Lord has entrusted us. And, uh, and I pray that the Lord will continue to provide as he always has, and almost especially to encourage us to not be afraid to go into, you know, places that are facing a lot of difficulty right now, and to encourage those that, that need to know about the Lord. Can I just close in prayer? Heavenly Father, God, I thank you, Lord, for this day and the blessing, Lord, that you have given us through your word. And thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be reminded about who you are, Jesus the wonderful, mighty God that you are. And Lord, uh, we ask forgiveness if there's been situations in our lives where we feel afraid, where we, feel, we forget who you are, when we try to control situations by our own means, in our own ways. I pray, Lord, that today, as you spoke to us through your word, that all of us will be reminded that everything belongs to you, that we are just stores of things. And Lord, I pray that you replace fear with faith, that you replace fear with confidence, that, Lord, instead of us running away from you, we can come to you knowing that you care for us, that you love us, that you are waiting for us, like that, the Father, Lord, that was seeking for his lost son. Lord, that's the same Father that you are for us. And, Lord, as we come into this Easter weekend, help us, Lord, to remember about what you've done for us. Help us to remember that you died and you were, you were buried and you went into the tomb, but you were resurrected, that you're sitting on the throne, that you're coming back soon, Lord. Help us to celebrate that and help us also to encourage other people. Use us, Lord, as your instruments to therefore go into the nations and tell people about who you are and the promise and the hope that is in your name, Jesus Christ. I thank you, Lord, and I pray for my brothers here today. May you bless them. May you encourage them. May you help them. May you give them your peace. May you, Lord, um, strengthen them. May you provide for them in so many ways, Lord. And I thank you, Lord, for this. And we pray all this in your mighty name, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 God bless you.